Well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I wrote this little book um, for the EOUP series, Very Short Introductions, and since then I've got very interested in the presence of stories in the current times of dislocation and migration. So there's an actual um, angle to this talk which uh, follows on from the d definitions and discussion in the book, but is not quite exactly the same. Um, this, this is a wonderful work. You probably know her. She's a, she does these cut-out sculptures from old books. And um, it seems to me this captures brilliantly the idea of the secrecy of the story, the secrecy of the intimacy, the hidden knowledge deep in the forest, and the idea of the illumination that the story might bring. One of the, there are many ways to approach a definition of fairy tale. But one of the interesting aspects of it is that it's frequently associated with women's voices. Now, this may be, to some extent, derogatory, because Plato, for example, as early as Plato, he says, oh, those are just old wives' tales. So, so the old wife, the idea of the old wives' tale, which is exactly what it is in Greek, is a sense, a story, that is kind of what we call now fake news. You know, it's a kind of, it's a sort of an ostrum full of superstition and ignorance. So very, very early on, there's this, this derogatory aspect. And that may have led to the association of such material, fairy tales, fables. It's a vast body of work, but I'm going to stick to fairy tales. Um, the, this, um, it might have led to this associating them, attributing them. You know, we don't do it. We authority figures don't do it. Those old women do it. But that's probably not the case. It's probably also true that these were, this was a body of stories circulating um, on the... In, in, the, in family and private circuits. Because one characteristic of fairy tales is that it's not associated with literate elites. Now, that doesn't mean that it wasn't written down. A lot of them are written down, and I'll show you some very famous collectors. But on the whole, you didn't have to be somebody with an education to be able to pass on a version of Cinderella. And that means that it is actually the body of imaginative discovery and creation that links us all together. The numerous cultural variations, many different aspects of societies are reflected. If you are in a polygamous society, you have fairy tales about polygamy. If you're in a, etc. There's um, e e monsters take on the shape of local fears and so forth. But basically the structures are a form of language. They are what I've called an Esperanto of the imagination. We can talk to somebody from Finland or from Australia through the language of fairy tale. One of the earliest fairy tales written down is Cupid and Psyche, which is a Beauty and the Beast story. And it's interestingly set up in the middle of a remarkable novel, which some of you will know, um, Ap Apuleius' The Golden Ass, which is about the transformation of Lucius, the hero, into a donkey. And as a donkey, he experiences much suff many sufferings, the brutality of people, but also a lot of comedy. And then it ends with a religious initiation. But in the middle of this story, a young woman is abducted on her wedding night by bandits. And she's taken to a cave. Her husband is seized by the bandits and taken elsewhere. And she fears for his life, quite rightly. Um, and she's taken, she's called Carité. And she's taken by the bandits to their ca cave, their lair. And she's given into the keeping of a disreputable old woman. And the disreputable old woman, when she's weeping and weeping because she's lost her husband and she's been raped and abducted, she, um, the old woman says, let me tell you a story to make you feel a little better. And this is absolutely to the heart. I mean, this is a very early version of a fairy tale in print. This is, goes to the heart of the, of the characteristic defiance of the fairy tale. It's not exactly optimism. The, the happy ending is never elaborated. The, the story of cru cruelty and unkindness, of infanticide and starvation and so forth, and maltreatment will unfold fully occupying the story. And then at the end, it will be a promise that this will be changed. So, so it's an act of defiance more than an expression of how hope can take place. It's in, it was, but that spirit, that spirit of what Walter Benjamin called cunning and high spirits, um, flows through the conventional fairy tale, the, the traditional idea we have of the fairy tale. And it differs it from a myth. A myth will not necessarily come to a conclusion that is hopeful. 
or that's defiant. It will often be tragic. And it differs from a ballad. A ballad like the one you were hearing when you came in, which is a very famous, with numerous variations, both verbal variations and musical variations, that um, it's called binary in the Scottish tradition, and that one is called The Two Sisters. Uh, Emily Portman was singing it. And that's a story of two sisters who are rivals for the same man, and one sister kills the other one. And then when the sister has, um, she murders, she, well, after she's murdered her, she buries her, him, her in, in the mud of a riverbank. And then someone coming by sees a bone sticking out of the, of the mud, thinks it's an animal bone, and takes it out. And it's either a pipe, he either makes it into a pipe, or he makes it into a harp from her breastbone. And then he goes to play this minstrel, this, this shepherd who's found this, this, um, inst made this instrument for himself, goes to the king's hall and starts trying to play. And this, the, the musical instrument will only play the song of the murder. So when, it's, when, when he pipes on it, this, this pipe sings, I was your sister, you killed me. And if it's a breastbone that's been strung for a harp, the, bre the harp sings, you have strung me with my hair on your harp, and then tells the story of her murder. So, there are, so that is an example of a story that has you know, no happy resolution. It's just, a tr a, a sad, except there's a revenge on the murderer, but otherwise it's not into at all a happy story. Um, but it, is, it belongs to fairy tale. In one sense, it's supernatural, and it's the idea of the eloquent bone, which of course is very central to uh, the idea of the oral voice. So there, there are numerous examples in high literature um, of this idea of the circle of storytellers, and very frequently, as I said, female. So here, Boccaccio, they're fleeing the plague, and the women dominate the storytelling scene. So there you have, a, in, in Boccaccio, you have a tremendous collection of wonderful inventive stories that are, that are again attributed to, to women's passing on, to the traditions of exchanges between women. Um, the first famous collection that we all know, the, we all know because it contains Bluebeard, it contains Red Riding Hood, it contains Sleeping Beauty, is Charles Perrault. So here you have the example of what, what very characteristic pattern, which is that a man comes along who's highly educated, he was a very high court official um, under Louis XIV, and he, um, he collected stories he said that were just sornettes, they were just little trifles, they were absurdities, and, but he collected them from his grandmother and his servants, and then he wrote them in these very elegant, very, very elegant French, ironic, uh, delightful, sophisticated stories, which have been retold and retold many, many times in a different tone of voice. He's much more feline and savvy and sort of knowing than, than the way we, do, we produce these stories for children. He had a contemporary, uh, so he, and, so he, and he signed the book, Mother Goose. So there you have an example of someone who is a, you know, a worldly courtier taking on the identity of a poor old woman and a slightly absurd figure, Mother Goose, um, Mme Merlois in French. Um, and, it tra tra and it translated into English culture almost directly. We have, still have Mother Goose collections, Mother Goose books. Though he had a contemporary who was interestingly rather vanished as a name uh, from the history. So Marie-Catherine Denois was a contemporary of, of Perrault's, as I said, and she wrote many, many, in, um, many, many fairy tales that were turned into British pantomimes, um, like The Golden Goose, um, The Far... Uh, the, the, um, the, I'm trying to remember the one, Yellow Dwarf, these were all turned into Victorian pantomimes. And theatre and film are chief conductors of this form of literature. At the same time, and this is often forgotten because we think of, unfortunately, we are formed to think of the Islamic world and the Christian world as kind of, you know, cloven apart, <coughs> somehow existing in separate spheres. This was not at all the case. They were deeply entangled. And one of the ways they became very deeply entangled in our fairy tale tradition was interwoven with the um, Eastern, Oriental, and Middle Eastern fairy tale tradition was through the Arabian Nights. And the Les Mille et Nuits, it was published in French first. It's the first print edition of this immense collection of incredibly brilliant and elaborate stories 
a fantastic um, ra range of a range of human experiences, which I'll tell you in a second uh, about. But um, but th that, as you know, it takes place as a storytelling scene in bed. So the so the Sultan is killing all the women because he in his country because he believes that all women are perfidious, treacherous, uh, adulteresses. Uh, you know, he, so he's decided to murder them all. And Scheherazade, who's the daughter of his vizier, actually volunteers to um, marry him, on knowing that she's under threat, that the following morning he will have her head cut off, or he'll have her strangled. But she holds him by telling him stories. And in the Arabian Nights, you have a very clear picture of how stories were associated with this, not only with this idea that you can make you feel a little better, like the bride in the cave, but that you actually you could save your life. And I think that that might seem preposterous, but I think in our kind of very disrupted times and you know, turbulent and, and hostile times, the function of stories matters more and more because they have this power to actually to impinge on reality and to, uh, and to change reality. That the, the frameworks of narrative through which we work are more important than we perhaps allow. It's not a frivolous side, side long, so, so, uh, out to the side um, activity. It's very central to human thought. I mean, I feel, you know, I'm speaking to an audience who knows this extraordinarily well because the internet is, it's in some sense, an immaterial um, expression of this network of stories. And we're seeing a lot of the consequences of people being frightened of that power. And my, my kind of mission as a writer is to harness that power for, for the ends of justice and equality and understanding and deeper intelligence and so forth, rather than for disinformation and propaganda and other uses which at the moment are gaining ground. They don't necessarily need to gain ground, but they are gaining ground. Um, there are three quotations which I'd just like to quickly to, to mention to you. One is Ursula Le Guin, who unfortunately died, as you know, last year. Uh, she says, resistance and change often begin in art, very often in our art. She was, uh, she was addressing an audience of writers. Very often in our art, the art of words. So she's making the same point that Scheherazade, or the story Scheherazade is making, that you can influence and shape uh, the experience and reality through the power of words. Scheherazade tells many, many varied stories across a, a gamut of very terrifying uh, situations to the Sultan. And the ultimate aim is that he should see the error of his ways, that he should see that there were other ways of responding to an adultery than cutting off the heads of all women. So the story eventually um, goes in full arc after A Thousand and One Nights uh, to the resolution whereby he is a changed man. Um, unfortunately, we know from the world that this has not happened, because when I was reading the Arabian Nights very intensively, I, um, it was at the beginning of the war in Syria, and um, it was clear, you know, Assad kept coming up in my mind as I, as I read about this sultan who was so extreme and violent. And, um, of course, we know that however many stories we tell Assad, he doesn't change his views. So there is a problem. But um, the second quotation I wanted to mention to you was um, Hannah Arendt, um, who wrote in her excellent book, The Human Condition After the Second World War, stories are a form of action, the way we insert ourselves into the human world. And that, that she went on, the ability to produce stories is the way we become historical. She says produce stories, but actually I, you can modify that to retell stories. The way we take our traditions and refashion them um, makes our history, makes the history in which we are living. And the third, the third is, is, um, is from Walter Benjamin, in which he, in, he, he stresses that this, these individual acts of telling stories are part of a community, they're part of a collectivity. And he too, writing at the end of the Second World War, um, said, every morning brings us the news of the globe, and yet we are poor in noteworthy stories. And he went on with say, calling for, the, for more more speculative fiction that would build an experience in this, in this sort of mayhem of the aftermath of the war. 
um, folk art and the worldview of the child demand to be seen as collectivist ways of thinking. And I was very interested that you have such an emphasis on play in your reception area. Um, because it seems to me that that connects quite... Walter Benjamin was very, very interested in play and wrote wonderful things, wonderful stories for the radio for children. And this, 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 there is a connection there, that there is something about the, the fairy tale that is connected to the idea of the imagination at play. You're not tied to the objective representation of reality. You are speculative and you move freely within this Esperanto of fantasy to, in order to build poss possible alternative worlds. Okay, so um, the, that, that's, this is, the, the Arabian Nights were disseminated throughout the world in hundreds of different versions and variations. Um, and this, and in, in both English and French and then finally in Arabic, where they came into print in Arabic in the 19th century. So um, these are just, what, so they're the Grimm brothers. Um, they were the major collectors of the other famous stories that you know, um, Hansel and Gretel. Um, anyway, I will, we'll look at them in a moment. So, um, and they've dominated the scene, and they've brought, but they did themselves invoke female or uh, female sources. And when they came into English, so this is their, one of their principal sources, a very, very nice uh, portrait uh, by the younger brother who didn't collect stories but was an artist, um, of their, one of their principal um, sources of fairy tales. She knew very many of them. Then um, when they were translated into English, they interestingly, the English were anxious about the cruelty. So um, George Cruikshank, who was a cartoonist and a kind of campaigner actually, he was a teetotaler, and so when he, re when he rewrote, translated Cinderella in the Grimm version, he had the, set the, the fountains at the wedding flow with lemonade because he wanted to make sure that he was campaigning against drunkenness in, in England. But the emphasis in England tried to shift it to comedy, and you can see that in this frontispiece. They sort of, they, the stories become jollier and more, more kind of cheerful and and more absurd. There's a, there's a desire to pull away, which has now come back, actually. We're now, we now back with cruelty and violence. People now acknowledge strongly that that's a, that's a very, very intrinsic part of the fairy tale tradition. Um, the Cinderella that the Grimm brothers collected is the one where the ugly sisters cut off their heels and cut off their toes to fit into the glass slipper. And the prince realizes that it's not the right bride because there's blood in the shoe. So it's very bloody. And then at the end, the enchanted birds pick out the eyes of the sisters at the wedding, Cinderella's wedding. So they're both maimed in their feet and blinded in their eyes. Um, <laughs> very, happy, very happy ending. Very happy ending. That, that, the, that has an interesting um, um, little coda, which is that they collected it from the poorhouse in Marburg. They were students at Marburg. They began when they were very young collecting stories. So they were students at Marburg University. And they heard that there was an old woman in the almshouse, i.e. in the poorhouse, who knew a lot of stories. And they asked to see her and to take, collect her stories, and she didn't want to see them. She refused. So they paid the daughter of the almshouse director. They gave her a little, you know, tiny, I mean, not a little tiny, but she was a little girl. And, and, and asked, said to her, you know, you go in and ask her to tell you a story, and then you come out, tell it to us, and we'll write it down. And um, the little girl did this, and this is the Cinderella she told. And my, my feeling, my interpretation of this is that the old woman in the almshouse was passing on a female secret, a very, very cruel version of revenge amongst women. And she didn't want the fine gentleman from the university to know this kind of story. It was a it was a kind of promise between women, between generations of women, you know, that if you're, if you're badly treated, you will escape and there will be a wonderful revenge. And, <laughs> and um, so it's an interesting example. We don't have many actual um, scenes of that kind. We don't know the exact circumstances of a lot of collecting. And there's a lot of, of course, massaging and changing of the sources. Even the Grimm's pretended to be setting it down verbatim, but they couldn't. They kept rewriting them because we have the drafts. Okay, so one of the, um, there, are, there are many definitions of fairy tales that I can't go into here. One of them is obviously that the there's a presence of the supernatural, and that's a very important and, you know, defining 
characteristic, the enchantment of the supernatural. But there is a way in which the supernatural is there because reality can't be tolerated, can't be born. It is un so unbearable. Because the real heart of fairy tale content is suffering. It's a domain of pain. Um, you have, and then every kind of human aberration, crime, um, ordeal are, are represented. The, it, in spite of their supernatural clothing, their enchantments, their improbabilities, they're actually very close to real experience. So for example, this donkey skin, I don't know if any of you know it, it's the one that's most least reproduced from Perrault's collection because it's about father-daughter incest. And so in the story, her father wants to marry her after the death of her mother because she looks just like her mother and he's promised never to marry again unless somebody was as good as her mother. So he, so he asks to marry her. She doesn't want to marry her father and there's a lot of magic to help her. And, the one, and part of the magic is that she's given a kind of magic donkey skin um, and this is her in that disguise. And then she takes a job as a scullion in a kitchen. She flees her father. And interestingly, the story in its, it's rather light-heartedly written by Pierre The story upholds the girl against her father. So here you have a story of filial disobedience. She refuses to marry her father, as he asks her to do. That is, that the story is covertly, not, not covertly, is overtly upholding. The story is on her side. She's every, she, that it is the wrong thing for him to ask. So this story, if you imagine it being passed on, is a way in which the customs of the tribe are being communicated without actually telling a story of child abuse. I mean, this is, it's very fanciful. It feels like an, it's once upon a time far away in a great palace, a king, you know, etc. So it's sort of distanced by the act of liter literary imagination. But at the same time, it's carries this seed, a very important seed. I mean, if you could imagine how different it would be if the child abuse stories were told in this way, we would understand. I mean, it's in a way a lack of them that has made, caused some of the difficulties that we're experiencing today. Ch children, if they were brought up with lots of fairy tales about Harvey Weinstein in disguise as a king, they would have a bit more of an understanding. Um, instead of being constantly promoted by the tabloids into being beautiful for to please and so forth so it's um it's a this is a great lost art of um i mean it's, it's coming back it's coming back but it's, a, it's to some extent a lost art of communication um it was made into a wonderful film in 1970 by jacques demy with catherine Deneuve in the role and i wanted to put this in not only to remind you what a great film this is but also that Film is probably one of the ways that most of you have encountered fairy tales. It's the chief channel of communication for, for, for uh, even, even for children. They've not really read fairy tales so much as seeing them. It's because of this being lang this language of Esperanto, this Esperanto language, the big blockbuster studios love it because it can actually communicate across cultures. OK, so um, Cinderella is about stepmothers the same stepmother role is, in some languages, the same as the mother-in-law, the same word. So belle-mère in French means stepmother and mother-in-law. That's quite common in several societies. So the situation that Cinderella is in of being turned into a sort of skivvy and abused and not given food, very, very widespread in many, many cultures, that the, the, either the unwanted child of an earlier marriage or the um, daughter-in-law is turned into a servant. So this, again, in the heart of this fanciful tale of enchantment lies a very true, uh, true representation. Um, we're very imprinted by the film tradition. Um, and I'm sure many of you, probably all of you, have seen Snow White. I mean, it's incredibly early, I think, 1937. It's, uh, it's, I mean, he, he, he used the medium early on. Um, and there's another, here there's another catch, there's a catch, which is that this evil stepmother figure, we can, perhaps you can ask me about it later because I won't linger now, um, has become an archetype, an archetype. And here the reality uh, flips over in the sense that a lot of stepmothers today, of whom there are very, very many because of, of easier divorce, um, 
are um, much, you know, are really very well-meaning and long to be loved by their stepchildren and don't maltreat them at all. But the children have all seen Disney. <laughs> and, and so there you have the kind of, the, the reflection of reality in the stories from a different era impinging and f passing on and reflecting on the reality of experience in the present with a, with a dangerous effect. So this, and this means that the fairy tales need constantly to be re rewritten and re re reworked. The um, Maleficent, The Sleeping Beauty, that was recently done, did a very interesting re reworking, which we can talk about again later. This was a superb, a superb Snow White, which took on Disney directly. It didn't do anything kind of glib, like reverse the stepmother figure, but it made Snow White herself so interesting and so appealing and so beautiful, but it didn't have a happy ending. The film does not have a happy ending. So it's an example of how the new reworkings and re recreations of classic fairy tales actually often edge them into myth and ed edge them into tragedy. Hansel and Gretel, probably one of the most famous stories in the world, um, is about child abandonment due to starvation. And that is a very, very common um, predicament, uh, not only in the past. Quite a lot of the refugees uh, who are arriving in Europe are, are exactly in this situation. They're not, it's not exactly infanticide. In the story it says um, that we will leave them to die, but actually what happened in the, in the early modern period and probably before that, and is happening now in some of the war-torn areas, is that families are saying, leave, we're going to le leave, we're going to put you on the boat. You've probably read many of these refugee stories. We take you to the frontier, you're nine years old, we take you to the frontier, we're going to leave you there, because the, they will come and they will help you. So there's this sort of modern version of infanticide, which is, which is sending children into a place, to a place where they might be safer and have something to eat and have something some, which they don't have in the place they are. Um, I, these are wonderful, wonderful illustrations that David Hockney did. Um, with the children being cooked for supper. Again, an aspect of famine. Famine being, famine being one of the dominant spurs to the sufferings um, reflected in fairy tales. Um, Angela Carter once said a very famous thing. She said, um, she said um, a fairy tale, the definition of a fairy tale is a story in which one king goes to another king to borrow a cup of sugar. That's famine. <laughs> only the kings have sugar. So, um, only some kings have sugar. So this, um, here he's being mischievous with Rapunzel. Rapunzel is a story about a woman who an, a childless woman who takes the new baby of uh, the couple who live next door. And again, this is, some, this is actually a story which I wrote a short, I was inspired to write a short story from the point of view of the witch, because um, it seemed to me that it was very much about childlessness um, and adoption. I mean, she adopts, Rapun she adopts Rapunzel, and then she wants to keep her really safe. And then the prince comes by, and you probably know the story, and climbs up her hair, and, and then one day she says to the old witch who looks after her, she says, you know, why are my clothes getting a little tight? And the old witch, you know, loses her temper, realizes that someone has been getting in and, uh, and that Rapunzel is having a baby. And she, you know, beats her and abuses her. So, and cuts off her hair. That, of course, was cleaned up. It, originally, it was the Grimms couldn't bear the fact that uh, Rapunzel was pregnant, so they, she, they just had um, her be, say something completely different, which makes nonsense of the story. But the story is about overprotection of a woman who didn't have a child and has adopted a child, and that seemed to me to be incredibly rec recognizable as a contemporary experience. So that's, another, that's one of the images. Rackham, one, we had a fantastic tradition of, of um, illustrators in this country, including Arthur Rackham. Walter Crane, another one. Um, the, the body, the Beauty and the Beast corpus of stories, which comes down from Cupid and Psyche pretty directly, um, it are, is the vehicle of an enormous number of explorations of the state of marriage to a brute. So the, and the hope that's held out in Beauty and the Beast is that with love and time, the brute will turn into uh, a wonderful and lo lovable husband. 
The story, as we know it best of all, which is this version, um, was written by a governess uh, here in England in French. She was a French governess for her charges who were all in arranged marriages. So it's a, it's, it's a story that comes out of the arranged marriage in which you will you know, find this stranger who you have to marry and, um, and you must trust that this all will be well. But of course some versions, it's not all is well. And that's like Bluebeard. So Bluebeard is a, another classic, um, classic story that looks at the, at the inside of, a, of an abusive marriage. The, um, in the Arabian Nights opens with a very interesting example of um, a storyteller thinking about conditions in the world. Um, so the two kings who you see up hidden in the tree um, have both found their wives supposedly cavorting with slaves and having sex with them in a very raunchy and extreme fashion. The book is quite explicit, not for children, but the original. Um, and so they both decide that the world is not for them. This is a disgusting, they kill both their wives and then they decide the world is not for them and they go wandering across the world. And they come across, they, 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 and out of the sea comes a vast djinn um, and on his head he's carrying a glass casket in which there is the body of a beautiful young girl, naked body of a beautiful young girl. And she again, it turns out, has been abducted on her wedding night. It's interesting these, these motifs recur. And also you will notice the glass box, which of course gets into Snow White. So, um, so this glass coffin, um, which she is still alive, and he, he lets her out and the kings climb a tree to hide from, it, from they're scared of this djinn. And the djinn falls asleep. And when he's asleep, she solicits the kings, she's noticed them in the tree, and she solicits the kings and beckons them down and then orders them to make love to her. And um, they say, no, 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 absolutely, we're not that kind of person. And, um, and she insists, she says, if you don't, I will murder, I will ra ra raise the djinn and he arouse, I will wake him up and he will kill you. So they agree very reluctantly. And, um, <laughs> and then um, after they've both done the evil deed, she takes out of her clothes a string of rings and she demands that they give her a ring as a pledge of her of, the, the, of, of what's just happened and, um, and they say no they won't and she says well I'll wake up the djinn so they give her the rings and when she puts them on the string in the English version that makes her 98 rings so far into a hundred and in the Arabic version she's got 365 so that was censored in the English translation <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it was reduced. Um, so, um, the, the, interestingly, one of the scholars of this story, the obvious, the, sort of the surface of the story is rather misogynist. You know, here's this lascivious, this lascivious woman who demands sex and, you know, is having, taking this revenge in this, you know, she's sort of uncontrolled and she fulfills in the story all the worst imaginings of the two kings who've seen their adulterous wives, they now say, well, all women are like that. So they go back home and they, that's when they start killing all women. So it's, it's presented as women's wiles. As, but actually what it's, what, what's happened, in the, what, what you, can, you can also interpret the story, that it's telling you what will happen if you do wrong, if you take a woman from her wedding and try to and abduct her and keep her in a glass box. Women are, are, will not obey that, they will not submit. And this is, this is a fundamental wrong, and, it, and you will suffer for it. You will, it. There will be a consequence. So while it's put in a sort of fairy tale setting, it has actually a kernel of thinking about justice in it, especially if you imagine this beginning of the story in which we're going to hear many, many, many stories in which in the end the king will realize that he has come to the false conclusions and he must mend his ways. All right, one of the other um, important... Um, aspects of fairy tales that I, I've become increasingly interested in is, is their portability. They seem to transcend difficulties of translation. This is a very, very mysterious process. I mean, there are trade routes, there are, um, um, are travelling scholars, there are 
traveling missionaries, there are traveling voices that possibly translate these stories. But at the same time, it, it seems more fundamental than that, in that the sort of desire, the human desire to make stories and to transmit them and hear them overcomes cultural barriers in a very, very, very remarkable way. So uh, we have stories like the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the, is probably the earliest extant uh, imaginative piece of literature we have. It's written down in 800 BC, but it's much, much older in, um, in, in, a, in actual creation. And, it, um, and many, many of its elements, it's a fantastic book, which Alice was telling me she read <laughs> when she was studying. Um, it's a fantastic and exciting and wonderful, wonderful poem, full of deep um, human scenes of loss and love and exploration and power, everything. Um, its elements, it was only found in the mid-19th century, in the desert, in the library of Ashwadabhanipal in Nineveh. So it actually was only read um, then. So it's a, like a modern book. For 2,000 years, it wasn't read. So it burst on the scene, and many things in it were recognizable because the elements of the story had traveled. So for example, there's one whole cycle of stories within the Arabian Nights which is very close to Gilgamesh, in which the hero goes down to the bottom of the sea to cut, to pick the plant of immortality um, and, and other, many other aspects. And why the Victorians loved it was that it contained the story of the flood. It contains the story of Noah. He's got a different name, but it's the same story. And they thought, because they were Christians, they thought, ah, this proves the truth of the flood because we have another source for it. But actually what it proves is that Stories, stories circulate. They pass, they pass. This is a, the, the British Museum is full of these absolutely wonderful miniature stories, a wonderful form which I would love to use myself in which you, this is, you know, you roll this on wax. So it's the stories incised into it and then you roll it on wax and you get the frieze like that. Um, an example of another enormous body of fairy tales, Northern, Scandinavian. This became, the Ring of the Limbalogan, sort of Icelandic sagas, Norwegian sagas, got in, became the Wagner and the Ring Cycle. Huge living body of myth that then gives us Tolkien. Tolkien, as you know, such an incredible success as a film that, that New Zealand has now got most, its, its highest proportion of GNP comes from its CGI industries that was driven by the fact that the director decided to film <laughs> Tolkien in New Zealand. So that's, a, that's another a different sort of example of the material effect of fantasy and fairy tale. Um, the, 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 another crossing point, an important crossing point between East and West was the Mediterranean and the island of Sicily, which for a while was in under Arab rule and then changed to Norman rule, the same Norman family that conquered Britain. And, um, and we have one collection. This is another um, body of fairy tales that are proverbial, which are animal fables. So when you say one swallow never makes a summer, or a dog in the manger, or, or many, um, many other proverbial phrases that use animals as the reflect humans, they all come from Aesop's fables. And Aesop's fables have an earlier version in India. And, and they get into this Arabic book written in Sicily in the 12th century, where he expresses it as being between women telling stories. And they, um, but it's, um, and he makes variations. They're not the same as the Indian stories, nor are they the same as Aesop's fables, but they have jackals and, king, and, and, jackals and lions and um, you know, snakes, donkeys, all that, carry, all that vast cast of characters, animal characters, that then gets into the Lion King and to, into m much of popular literature. This is the, the ballad um, that I played you, so that's, um, I played because we played it at the beginning. And Angela Carter does a variation on that. I thought, when I was teaching at, at Fairy Tales, my students all wanted to know about Angela Carter. So I don't know if you want to know about her, but her, her wonderful story, The Earl King in the Bloody Chamber, 
um, is based on the sto story of the two sisters that, um, and the Earl King in her version, she's put the stories together, the Earl King in her version turns all his um, victims into singing birds and then she has to rescue them, the, the narrator. All right, so this is the coda. Um, this idea of stories as, habit as the place you dwell, the place that you create where you dwell, the way you furnish your imagination and use it to apprehend and engage with the world through the, through the narratives that you have as structure, and that this could form, could form a sanctuary. There was one very nice example of it in a, this, this man's book. He was a, became a very prominent literary critic in Germany, but he was in the, in the ghetto in Warsaw um, as a young man, and he just got married. And he and his wife fled, managed to get out of the ghetto before the um, massacres. And they were hidden by two Protestant Germans in their cellar. The, Protestant, the Protestants were out of work. It was very bad times. There was very little to eat um, during the war. And they, but they didn't shelter the two Jews for reasons of benevolence. They sheltered them because they enslaved them. And they made them roll cigarettes for the contraband traffic in cigarettes. So they were in the dark in the cellar um, and very much at the mercy, uh, very frightened at any moment they would be denounced, that it would not in the end be worth the while of their shelterers to keep them and feed them um, in return for what they got for their cigarettes. And, um, but one day the woman came down she said, I'm so bored I could scream. And this man in his 20s, Marcel, decided that he would tell her a story. And he ransacked his mind for everything he'd ever read. He, every film he'd ever seen, every opera plot he'd ever heard about, every, every sort of nursery rhyme, absolutely everything. And the, the, the atmosphere completely changed. They became very dependent on hearing more stories. And, um, and then by the end of the war, they were, I mean, they were not denounced. They were, the end of the war came and we made a great hardship. And the, um, and though they were not exactly sort of best of friends, they were definitely on terms that were different from the terms that the Germans and their Jewish victims had been on before he told them the plot of Aida. <laughs> you know, it's this most extraordinary modern example. Of, um, I think he must have been very good at it um, because it's not always, and he must have been very good at remembering too. Um, so. I think that the, the concept of sanctuary um, was a legal, Alice is a lawyer, I don't know if she knows about the legal. For a thousand years, there was a concept of sanctuary in this country. You could, until Henry VIII abolished it, you could establish a place that was a safe place. It was not an armed place. It had no fence or, or lock. It was simply a symbolic place that was created by the decree of words. So, you, so the place was designated by custom, tradition, and language as the sanctuary. So this is an example that still exists. And you'll notice that it has on it this monstrous face. And they frequently, sanctuaries, sanctuary places such as still survive, that's another one that doesn't have a monster, but they often have, like the door knockers of sanctuary buildings, have a monstrous face on them. And I think the connection, so this is another one in Norwich, and this is the famous one in Durham. <laughs> and, um, and I think the connection is that it, it connects to the fundamental recognition that the patterned, patterned words have what's technically called performative power. They will institute, they can institute something like a safe place. And I think that's forms that, that presents an analogy for what stories can do. They can demarcate a space in which you are free to do certain things, like imagine delicious revenges or, um, or reparation or redress, but you're still held safely within it. It's not, going to be, it's not going to endanger you, this speech. The speech of imagination is not quite the same as direct communication. And the other thing is that words have efficacy as in, to institute reality. And th this is something, obviously this is partly magical thinking and a lot of people dissent from it, but it's something that I have sort of pretty much come to acknowledge and accept. And, 
and even support um, throughout my work, which began with looking at religious symbols, which certainly have this power, and, um, and now looking at secular, secular storytelling. So we, I started, this is the end, I started a project in Sicily with the, with the, with the um, refugees there, because Sicily is this crossing point. Um, right here is a map of the, from the 17th century showing Sicily right in the middle of the Mediterranean. Um, they, all, they all arrived there, 600,000 in the last two years. And, and one of the problems of the, uh, uh, you know, we were talking about traveling stories and how they leap cultural barriers. But actually, how do you tell a story to someone who doesn't know your language? So we, we wanted to, to, to find a way of creating stories from imagination, not their own stories, not their testimony, very different kind of story. To, stories they might remember themselves from their, from, their, from their culture, stories they want to invent themselves now, and how are we going to do it? And of course, Sicily has a tremendous tradition of puppetry. And so there are many languages beyond language that are uh, communicative. So there's puppetry, there's music, there's um, gesture, dance. And so we're working with puppets. Um, this is the puppet theater, traditional puppet theater in Palermo. Here they are learning, the puppets. Learning to use, they took to it, they really loved it. We do dancing ask them how they dance in their countries. Um, we do group, group. Um, this, this is a sort of word game. As it comes around to you, the ball, as you throw the ball and make this web, you, you, you say a word in, as, either as part of a story or I mean, you give a structure ahead of time. And, then, and that works also rather well. Um, and um, so here's a group session on sound, making sounds. And this, was, this is part of the Gilgamesh workshop. So here they're making the sounds of the city of Uruk um, as a sort of chorus. So they did bird songs and you know, animal sounds and not exactly traffic sounds because there wouldn't have been so much traffic in Uruk then. But, um, um, and here is, I think, Gilgamesh. That's his visor. Yes, that's the sort of beginning of the Gilgamesh puppet. And here they are doing an animation. We took an animator with us. And they really loved this. This is to do animation on your phone. Um, and they really, really like doing that. Here are three of the characters. Um, if, you know the, if you know the epic, that's Sidori, the innkeeper, the tavern keeper on the right. Um, I think probably Enkidu in the middle. That's the plant of immortality. We made it with balloons. And here's, here's another Gilgamesh, a different Gilgamesh. Um, and that, we got a very good write-up in the local paper, which we were very pleased with. So, um, so this was an idea of taking really conforming to my ideas about the transmission and the uh, freedom of the language of stories and trying to adapt it to our present day a crisis of young people arriving and hoping to make a better world for themselves and for us too. Thank you. off with a question. Um, you talked about the Cinderella story and how that was given to a young girl by a woman. Um, and so obviously we receive these stories quite differently now. We see them en yeah. masse yes. on film. Mm. How does that change the way we receive a story when we're not getting it woman to woman or father to son? Well, there has been a return actually to women's presence in the fairy tale transmission. Um, I mean, the Maleficent was produced by Angelina Jolie and the, and the script is, I think, by Linda Wolverton, who did Beauty and the Beast as well. So there's been a recognition within the industry that actually, and it's not just for, you know, reasons of the women are coming up, it's actually women being identified with that genre and wishing to rewrite it themselves in order to, in order to transform it. I mean, I, I was I'm pleased that it, I have some... Um, men in the audience, because normally I, the, when I speak about fairy tales, it's almost always women only. There's a very strong feeling for um, the relationship of fairy tales and women. And it's partly that it's one of the main literary bodies of work in which women feature prominently. I mean, the, the characters, the, the prince character is often very sort of not very colourful, you know, rather dim. So there's more interest in the women's characters. Even the, even the malignant women, there's a real, in the same way as in Greek myths too, there's 
women are attracted to the Greek myths because they're full of women, full of, full of different scenarios around women. I mean, Medea is a great favorite now with women directors and actors. So, um, so but your other, uh, the, the other aspect, which is sort of in a sense less, less positive, and it's, as, it's also a problem of the web, and that is that there's a sort of homogenization because you're not speaking in particular to a group, you're speaking more widely. So you need to please kind of too many people um, or to please a particular group without actually troubling them. So that's, I mean, there's a, the, the audience, the mass audience, is, it creates, um, yes, a, a difference of specificity. There's a Cinderella variant, a, a don donkey skin variant, um, which actually puts this, shows this quite clearly, which is, it was collected by an anthropologist from a very poor part of Spain, Estremadura. And in the donkey skin that version, she doesn't wear a donkey skin, she wears a pelican skin. And he, could, he couldn't understand why this heroine is, is disguised as a pelican, because there are absolutely no pelicans in Spain. And then he, when he went there to do his, few, when, I mean, he realized that the endemic illness in the area was goiter. So in this story, she's loved in spite of being a donkey, or looking or wearing a smelly, horrible, filthy donkey skin. The prince recognizes her true beauty underneath her disguise. And in Estremadura, this pelican disguised girl is also recognized in the story for her beauty and goodness beneath her pelican skin, which of course is standing in for the illness of Goita. In that particular area, it wouldn't work if you put it in a film because it wouldn't make the same particular sense. Yeah. I, I think you um, began to touch on it just now already, but how do kind of myths and legends, are they seen as separate to fairy tales or are they seen as sort of the male power versions <laughs> of the more domestic fairy tale issues, how do they interrelate? Well, there are, yes, I mean, one of the main different, there are obviously overlaps. And um, as I said, I think that there's a tendency now, a trend that the fairy tale mode is move, becoming more mythical. But um, the, the one of the main differences is that the characters in fairy tales are humans with some magic. They're not gods. So, so the, the, and the other is that while there were some people in different cultures who believe in some of the supernatural elements in fairy tales, on the whole they are not connected to official religion. I mean, that's a fairly it's a rule of thumb. I mean, the jinn are in the Quran, so the jinn are actually should be believed, whereas the fairies are not in the Bible, so we don't have to believe in them uh, according to doctrine. But and there have been c communities that certainly believed in fairies and still do, probably. But, um, I mean, I think there are quite a lot, like witches are sort of coming back, people believe in them. So it's, um, you know, there are aspects that are connected to real belief. But on the whole, the fairy tale is a space of unbelief. It's a space of, uh, of imagination. It does not, you're not requested to consent to its structures. That, that's pretty different. I mean, with myths, with Greek myths, we don't consent to the Olympians anymore, but we do, um, they, they did in the past. I, I, if I understood you right, I think you said earlier that we, were, we had, for a period, lost the ability to tell fairy tales or to create new fairy tales, but that it was coming back. Mm. I was wondering if you could tell us why you thought that was. Well, there was, it's, it's very complicated and difficult to understand because the Romantics were very interested in fairy tales. I mean, they, the, the, the lyrical ballads, Wordsworth and Coleridge, contains poems they wrote because they had collected some of the oral traditions that in Scotland and so forth. So um, if you think of a famous poem like La Belle Dame Sans Merci, in which the knight is palely loitering and meets a fairy by a lake who kisses him and takes him into her world. I mean, this is a fairy tale. So, but at exactly the same time, the fairy tales began falling down the ladder of esteem and became associated with children. It was partly an effect of ma the market because we, uh, there was a rise in ch child children who could read. The rise of the bourgeoisie in Victorian England meant that more children could read. 
and there was a market, to, and some of those beautiful books that were made were made for children, elite children who could, parents could afford these nice books. So it, but that put it into a kind of niche, and in that niche was the romantic idea that the imagination was the property of the child. You know, when R Wordsworth wrote, not an entire forgetfulness and not an utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come, the child is a sort of marvelous creature full of connections to other worlds and imagination. But that made it childish. And also, we were very strongly then uh, sort of encouraged or enjoined not to yield to fantasy and imagination, that we adults should be rational and we should be objective and we should assess evidence. You know, all this stuff about fairylands and things was nonsense and it was only fit for children. So it fell under a huge kind of cloud of incomprehension because you don't have to think of this as, it's, it's, a, it's a way of thinking. You know, the, thinking with the imagination is a way of thinking. It's not to be dismissed. It's probably essential. It's probably inevitable. It is also essential. Because you can't really, you have to model thought. I mean, they've now discovered with lots of cognitive studies that the imagination is not separate from reason in the brain. The, the, the synapses, same synapses fire. If I say to you, lady, you know, uh, um, um, what is the wonderful line? Um, a unicorn sat under a juniper tree. If I say a lady, a lady with a unicorn sat under a juniper tree, you bring it up in your mind's eye. And you, when you're doing that, it's the same as if I say to you, I met your mother last week. Your mother comes up in your mind's eye then you assemble it with me in your mind, then you're using the same faculties. The, the far, same place fires. So, so, so thinking models, models thought using imaginative powers. You're looking. <laughs> I think that's really interesting on, on so you think maybe the invention of childhood in the Georgian and Victorian periods meant that we compartmentalize different kinds of stories as belonging to different kinds of imaginative and domains. But, but why then are fairy tales coming back? Is it something well, to do with adults reclaiming childhood for themselves? <laughs> well, there is a lot of, I mean, there's been a lot of very, very powerful work on play. I mean, Winnicott wrote, you know, very powerfully on the import, I mean, the development of children and the capacity to play in order for them to become fully achieved adults has been a, has been a, pit, a cornerstone of Piaget, of Winnicott, of, of Melanie Klein. Um, and I don't think people have overturned that at all. Now Adam Phillips has written about this very importantly. I mean, and I think, you know, you have this ethos here because in order to think, the, think up the projects that, you know, are new, new thinking requires play. You can't just stick to what's already known. So it's that's um, so I think there's been a uh, yes, there's been a recuperation and a re-evaluation, re a transvaluation of fantasy and imagination. They're slightly different, but nevertheless, it's the, the two are, are contiguous, contingent, and um, and uh, but there are, but there are attendant dangers. I mean, the people who, who insist on objectivity and so forth are. Um, you know, they, ha they have identified a danger, which is we can't live in entirely in, I mean, imagination does not exactly need to be tested, but I mean, it is the great task of our time is to how, is to, how to in inspire people to question what they imagine and what they think, but not by using only the, t the real stick of objective verification, because that will just trap us in what we already know. Thank you very much for me. Okay. <laughs>